Caution. This video might change what you believe about the past. We love nothing more on this channel than a good roundup of incredible ancient artifacts, and we've found another stupendous collection for you. Kick back, relax, and allow us to be your tour guides on a journey to times long ago and far away. Our first discovery was made in October 2011 during an archaeological survey of a site close to Donnerail, County Cork, Ireland. There, archaeologists discovered the foundations of the ancient Caher Dugan Castle and the moat that once surrounded it. The name translates into English as the Fort of the Dugans, with the chieftains of the ancient Dugan clan founding a ring fort here somewhere close to the start of the 5th century and remaining until 1169. The reason there's so little of it left is that the castle was deliberately demolished in the mid-19th century and the stone was taken away to be used in construction projects elsewhere. However, the lack of visual clues didn't stop archaeologists from finding a deep well at what would have been the rear of the castle, and at the bottom of the well, a medieval leather horse harness among other artifacts including leather shoes, a leather belt complete with its buckle and studs, and gaming dice made of bone. Strangely, all of the artifacts date to either the 13th or 14th centuries, long after the castle had been abandoned. The presence of the objects in the well is considered unexplained. In May 2022, a long-lost Native American artifact finally made its way home. It's the ceremonial dress of Chief Crowfoot, who was the leader of the Siksika Nation during the 19th century. The Siksika people are native to Canada, and Chief Crowfoot is considered one of their greatest ever leaders, famous for his bravery on the battlefield, but also for his acumen at the negotiating table and his commitment to protecting his people. It was Chief Crowfoot who signed the famous Blackfoot Treaty in September 1877. His ceremonial dress has been housed in the Royal Albert Memorial Museum and Art Gallery in Exeter, England since 1878, Items of clothing taken from the chief include his leggings, buckskin shirt, quiver, bow case, horse whip, and a pair of beaded bags. The Siksika people have long wanted the artifacts back, and they finally got their wish. The entire collection was handed over to a delegation from the modern Siksika nation led by Chief Ure Crowfoot on May 19th. Nobody's entirely sure how the objects ended up in England in the first place, but it's thought that they might have been taken by a British administrator, Cecil Denny of Alberta, Canada, shortly after the treaty was signed. A confusing and challenging sculpture was found at a Neolithic site in Golan Heights, Syria in July 2022. It's an 8,000-year-old mother goddess figurine with strange coffee bean-like eyes. The figure, which is less than 7 inches long, was almost certainly created by a member of the Yarmoukian culture and represents the mistress of the Levantine underworld. The Yarmoukians were the first people in this part of the world to make clay pottery, and so are regarded as the first cultured society to live in prehistoric Syria and Israel. We found artifacts and sculptures made by them before, but none of them have eyes like this. Historians and archaeologists think that while the eyes might look like coffee beans, it's more likely that they're intended to represent wheat or barley kernel, thus representing the promise of new life. The resemblance to coffee must be coincidental because people in this part of the world had no idea that coffee even existed 8,000 years ago. Experts aren't sure whether this mother goddess was a deity from a religion that was already established or a cultic icon. We might never know. There's always been something a little strange about the Sumerian king list, which exists in several different forms. The most famous of them is the Weld Blundell Prism, which can be found in Oxford, England at the Ashmolean Museum. It was found in Iraq in 1922, and has been causing problems for historians ever since. That's because of the lengths of the reigns ascribed to some of the former Sumerian rulers it's said to record. The most recent reigns detailed on the list are normal and presumably accurate. Sin Majir of the Isin dynasty, for example, is credited with an 11-year reign that began 3,830 years ago. Look closer to the beginning of the list, though, and you'll find kings credited with reigns that span several centuries. One of them is said to have ruled for 3,600 years. 
Obviously, this is impossible, but historians have no idea why the rains have been recorded in this way. Their best guess is that the length of the rains has been exaggerated to emphasize the greatness of that particular king. A second possibility is that, in some cases, a rain could be passed down from father to son and seen as a direct continuation rather than a replacement. Are either of these theories correct? Or are they both wrong? Sadly, we might never know. Our next discovery comes from early August 2022 and is considered such a significant find that the precise location it was found at is being kept under wraps. All we know is that it was found somewhere in Lower Silesia, Poland. The artifact is a 1,000-year-old Bolslaw sword, meaning it dates to the reign of the great King Bolslaw the Brave, who reigned between the years 967 and 1025. The weapon isn't thought to have belonged to the king, but rather to a knight who served him closely. It's an elegant weapon, but with a length of more than three feet, it would also have been difficult to carry and a little impractical. The archaeologists responsible for the discovery say the sword's in great condition, which is an odd thing to say given it's broken into several pieces. According to local historian Merrick Kowalski, the value of the sword is almost impossible to overstate. He says it would be worth more than the combined value of everything in the ancient villages that used to exist here and would never have been abandoned voluntarily. Many battles between the Czech Bohemians and the Piasts were fought in and around Lower Silesia, so that might be the best explanation of how the sword came to be left behind. If you're involved in a dispute with someone today, you might send them an angry message on social media. Social media didn't exist in Athens 2,500 years ago, so people had to find other ways to record and direct their written ways. It seems some people did so using curse tablets, like this one that was found at the bottom of a well in the city in February 2020. It's one of more than 30 small lead tablets that were found in a water well in Karamekos, which was the main burial ground for Athens in ancient times. The rough inscriptions on their surface asked the gods of the underworld to rise up and cause harm to the enemies of the authors, some of whom are named. We can't help but wonder what these people did to deserve having curses cast against them. The creation of cursed tablets was a common practice in both Greece and Rome more than 2,000 years ago, and wells were a common place to throw them because it took the message closer to the gods that the writers hoped to receive divine assistance from. The crew of the Dutch fishing vessel Weringer 22 were performing their regular everyday duties in July 2022 when they caught something unexpected. The shrimp cutter ensnared a strange-looking wooden statue, and experts still aren't sure what to make of it. The statue is the kind that would have sat on the stern of Dutch vessels of the 17th century, but it's in such good condition that it's hard to believe it could be so old. To confuse matters further, the individual depicted by the statue appears to be wearing a Phrygian cap. Caps like these were worn in battle by Phrygian warriors, but those battles occurred more than a thousand years before the 17th century. The caps were important to the Phrygians because they were symbols of overcoming oppression. When Phrygians were enslaved by Romans, they were shaved bald. When they regained their freedom, they wore caps to hide their baldness, initially out of shame, but over time, the caps came to represent freedom rather than shame. Experts are fairly sure the sculpture isn't a hoax, but will only know for sure after they've examined it. They can't do that yet because it needs to undergo preservation work now that it's been removed from the water. Our next discovery is a little grisly, so look away if you're squeamish. It's known simply as the Mosaic Votive Skull, and it sits in the collection of the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, Mexico. It looks like a work of art rather than a genuine human skull, but beneath the decorations and turquoise tiles is the skull of an Aztec man who passed away a very long time ago. However, all's not as it seems with this artifact. It's typical of the painted in mosaic skulls that we know the Aztecs made hundreds of years ago, and the skull is ancient. But the decorations on the mosaic votive skull weren't added until 1967. 
The work was performed specially for the museum, which wanted an example of this mysterious form of Aztec art, but couldn't find any original examples. To make sure it looked authentic, the artisans sourced turquoise from former Aztec territories like Guerrero, Veracruz, and Oaxaca. Turquoise was valued so highly by the Aztecs that it was worth more than gold, and vast quantities of it were delivered to Emperor Montezuma at Tenochtitlan as tributes every year. The ancient Romans were very good at street planning. If you want proof of that, all you need to do is look at the Forma Urbis Romae, or at least look at the pieces of it that have survived to the modern age and been found. Also known as the Severan Marble Plan, the Forma Urbis Romae was made to order by Emperor Septimus Severus somewhere around the year 203. It's an enormous map of Rome as it looked at the time, made of solid marble. When it was complete, it measured 60 feet by 45 feet and was made of 150 marble slabs slotted together. The whole map was mounted on an interior wall within the Temple of Peace. The floor plans of every insula, bath, and temple were recorded on the Forma Urbis Romae, along with the city's ancient boundaries. Oddly, the south of the city is at the top of the map. Sadly, the people of the Middle Ages saw no value in the map and started breaking away chunks of marble to use for other purposes. Only about 10% of it has survived to the present day. If you translate the Japanese word karakuri into English, it means trick. That gives you a clue about the nature of the karakuri puppets. To call them puppets, though, is to do them a disservice. These 17th century inventions should more accurately be called robots or automatons. The purpose they served was a humble one. When placed in the right position and given the necessary tools, they were capable of pouring a cup of tea. They weren't really intended to be a convenience for their owners, though. They were more a way of the owner showing off to visitors. The great Japanese inventor Takeda Omi took the idea of a karakuri puppet to its furthest extreme in 1662 when he built puppets the size of human beings and created a whole theater show around them. To the majority of the audiences who paid to see the puppets, what Omi was doing would have seemed like magic. It's a wonder he wasn't accused of witchcraft. The dolls are no longer seen as mystical in Japan, but you might see one or two of them in traditional Japanese homes. Customer service is a frustrating role to work in and a frustrating process to deal with. People who work in customer service roles often despair of the complaints that they receive from customers. The people who make those complaints frequently despair about the quality of the service they receive. Despite what you might think, this is not a problem of the modern world. In fact, it's a problem that's been going on for at least 4,000 years. This ancient Mesopotamian tablet, found in the ancient city of Ur in Iraq, is said to be the oldest customer service complaint in the world. It was etched by an artisan named Nani and addressed to a merchant named Ia Nasir. Apparently, Ia Nasir had sold Nani some poor quality copper ingots and then refused to refund Nani's money. So now Nani planned to come visit him to address the matter in person. That sounds like a threat to us. The language used is cuneiform, which is believed to be one of the first written languages to emerge in the Middle East. Wonder if Nani ever got his money back. When is a ring not a ring? When it's an astronomical sphere. This beautiful 400-year-old ring is one of a handful of examples of ancient pieces of jewelry that could allow you to wear the entire universe on your finger. They're known as armillary spheres and appear to have been invented simultaneously but independently in Greece and China. The tiny artifacts are made of a series of spherical rings with a representation of either the sun or the earth at their center. The complexity of the rings is almost invisible when they're closed but the bands can be fanned out to become something else entirely. The most basic of the rings have two moving bands, but more ornate examples might have as many as eight. The majority of them feature either inscriptions or depictions of the signs of the zodiac marked on them in enamel. They were worn as a statement of intelligence and wisdom and were at the peak of their popularity during the 18th century. 
Most of them are purely decorative. But the best examples also include lines of celestial latitude and longitude that can be used to make astronomical observations. There are also several examples of much larger armillary spheres, but the ring versions are the most beautiful. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.